Since 2015, Pop Health Podcast has brought to you some of the best minds in healthcare, including leaders from government, not-for-profit, and investor-backed powerhouses, as they share successes, failures, and how our audience can move forward in today's constantly evolving healthcare world. Thank you for joining us for today's episode presented by 24-Hour Home Care. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a special edition of Pop Health Podcast. I'm Gavin Ward, host of Pop Health Podcast. Today's episode was taken from our very first live event in November of 2021, titled Pop Health Podcast All-Stars, Innovate, Integrate, and Motivate. And our guests are from some of the leading organizations in, in home care. And that includes Paul Verhove, who is the CEO of Mission Healthcare, one of the largest, if not the largest, health, uh, home health hospice and palliative care provider on the West Coast. We also had Josh Prophet, who is the president of LHC Group, one of the largest national providers of in-home care services. And lastly, we had Bob Hawley, who is the editor for Home Healthcare News. We learn a lot in today's episode of what's happening in 2021 and beyond, and we hope you learn quite a bit yourself and enjoy today's special episode. Thanks, everybody. Well, good morning or good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our last session of our very first live Pop Health Podcast event with what we like to call all stars as past guests, organizations, or industry experts. I would like to introduce our panelists today who I've had the pleasure of getting to know over the last few years. And we'll go ahead and start with Bob Hawley. Bob, I believe it's appropriate for me to say good afternoon. It is indeed. Uh, good Good afternoon. Good morning, Gavin. Uh, ho- hopefully you're hanging in there. It sounds like you have a marathon day. I have a marathon day. Uh, yes, we started at uh, 9 a.m. Pacific, uh, so our event is three hours long. So uh, mini, mini marathon. I guess some people can run marathons in three hours or less, actually. <laughs> uh, folks, if you're not familiar with Bob, um, formerly Robert Hawley or Bob Hawley, um, who well, some of you may know is also the name of a WWE wrestler. I don't know if we talked about this, Bob, before, but <laughs> we, we didn't, but I, uh, I have gotten that before. Yeah, I think it's uh, Hardcore Holly was his uh, stage name. Yes, absolutely. So, uh, Bob, uh, previously uh, to joining Home Healthcare News, uh, did some work in technology and was part of the Chicago Tribune's uh, Blue Sky Innovation section and also covered the Midwest Center for Investigative Reporting. Bob, you've been with uh, Home Healthcare News, what, how many years now? Uh, Since April, 2018, I believe. Uh, And I came into the industry as a complete newbie, didn't know really anything about home healthcare, didn't know anything about home care. So uh, a lot of your audience members here probably went through the growing pains with me, had some patience as I learned the ropes, but uh, it's it's been a fun ride since then. Awesome. And both you and your organization have grown tremendously since. I really appreciate you investing the time today with us, Bob. All right. Uh, Next up, we're going to introduce Paul Verhove, who is leading Mission Healthcare, which is a rapidly growing uh, post-acute care services organization, mostly uh, pretty much on the West Coast now. Uh, Paul, good morning. Good morning, Gavin. Good to be here with you. Good to be as well. Paul was one of our very first YouTube episodes, as was the next panel, so we'll introduce in a second. So uh, folks, feel free to check out his episode, which is back in 2020. Had the privilege of knowing Paul and seeing him uh, in his career, I would say as a really an expert well-known throughout the home health, hospice, and post-acute care uh, community over the last 20 years or so. So again, good morning. And I want to introduce our next guest. And I know unless you're in California or West Coast, Josh, good afternoon to you. (laughs) Uh, Good afternoon, Gavin, and again, great to be uh, with you again. Uh, Bob, great seeing you. Paul, likewise, look forward to the dialogue today. And um, Bob, I have often wanted to say Hardcore Holly and just haven't been able to bring myself there, (laughs) so now I feel like I can. Yeah. Glad we opened up that can of worms. (laughs) (laughs) Well, my uh, my old school friends, I'm going to have to joke that we used to watch WWE together. I'm going to have to bring this up to them. We'll get a kick out of it. Um, Okay, so uh, Josh Prophet uh, is the uh, president of LHC Group. And uh, for those of you that may not, they're like LHC Group, what is that? Well, it's actually the an organization, one of the largest in the country that's delivering uh, home health, hospice, palliative care, home and community-based services, but they often operate under different names. So LHC is, is the parent uh, or the, the true company that's uh, delivering the services. So Josh will talk a little bit more about that. Uh, one cool thing about Josh, uh, I know he's actively, uh, you still got some volleyball skills, I guess we can say. Um, and we talked about that in the episode that was also uh, last year in 2020 alongside 
uh, Paul's episode. So feel free to check that out. Okay, let's go ahead and get started in our last session. So before we jump into the meat and potatoes of today's uh, dialogue or conversation, guys, let's get to know you a little bit and perhaps your favorite podcast. If you listen to podcasts, we'll start with you, uh, Bob. Favorite podcast. Well, I have to shamelessly plug Home Healthcare News for a second because I would have to say my favorite podcast is our podcast, uh, right, right after yours, of course, Gavin. Uh, <laughs> disrupt. Uh, that's the podcast where we try to get home health, home care leaders on once a month just to talk about what they're going through. On a personal level, I'm a huge baseball fan, uh, the White Sox specifically, so I, I love listening to White Sox Talk podcast. And then uh, Jason Benetti, one of their great broadcasters, along with Len Casper on the radio side, they do a podcast called, um, oh my God, I'm blinking on the name, uh, Sox Degrees of Separation, also really, really good. They have some celebrities that come on it as well, but huge baseball fan, so I enjoy listening to that one. Nice. One of my favorite baseball cards that I own is the Frank Thomas uh, rookie card. So, yeah, yeah uh, a little White Sox connection there. I didn't know much about the White Sox, but there's this guy, Frank Thomas, that everyone was talking about. So, one of, one of the greatest uh, right handed hitters ever. Yes. Uh, all right, Paul, over to you. Favorite podcast? You know, much like the other uh, panelists, I'm not a huge podcast person, which I know is probably blasphemous to say <laughs> as, we're, as we're doing this. Uh, still very old fashioned. I like to read quite a bit. Um, you know, from time to time, I will uh, I will jump into a couple of crime podcasts. You know, something that's not work related because I find myself really spending a lot of my non work time reading about things that are work related. Uh, and I also don't have a very long drive into the office, so uh, they're very small clips of time. So usually, I use that for more time of uh, of thinking because uh, it's the only time where no one else is trying to speak to me or I have to speak to somebody else. So. Apologize, Gavin, but I definitely would plug, uh, you know, Pop Podcast as well as uh, Home Health News because, uh, you know, I, I follow everything that's in the industry. Awesome. And uh, Paul, just to clarify, your house is not a boat like your colleagues, correct? It, it is not. I actually live in a, a home that's on, on a foundation and okay. it is in California, so probably cracked due to earthquakes, but uh, it's, it's still prone. Nice. The reason I bring that up, folks, uh, Paul has a, a co-leader in his organization, uh, Damien, who uh, who has a home in Arizona. But when he comes out, uh, Mission does a lot of work in, in California. So uh, Damien's home is a boat, which is pretty cool to hear. Um, also, a quick note, Paul, I'm not sure if you've heard of the EBB or Earthquake Brace Bolt program for homes with a foundation. Um, I actually just got that work done. It's actually paid for by the government in California um, to secure the home a little bit better in case for that big one that's going to come in the future. So uh, for, for folks with foundations in California, something to look into. <laughs> well, I'm far enough east that I'm hoping for if there is one of those earthquakes that I may have oceanfront property at some point in time. So we'll see. <laughs> there you go. All right, Josh, and we'll wrap it up with you. Uh, if you don't listen to podcasts, maybe similar to, similar to Paul, just uh, how do you get your news or listen information? Sure, sure. No, I, I will, you know, finish up the trifecta. I'll give the shameless plug. I'll go pop health and I'll go home health news. You got to say those two. Um, but outside the shameless plugging, um, I, I'll maybe give you one on the business side and one on the personal side. Uh, on the business front, and it's probably one that many of your listeners are, are uh, familiar with, which is Freakonomics. Uh, you're probably familiar with that book from, you know, back probably 15, 16 years ago now. Uh, but um, some pretty provocative, you know, economic, financial, and from time to time, some pretty good healthcare uh, nuggets on that one. And then on the personal front, um, I really love listening to uh, the podcast Love Worth Finding. Uh, it's by an author, Adrian Rogers, and it's just got some real good kind of biblical and faith-based content and messages um, that, you know, much like Paul and Bob, you know, try and disconnect from just all business all the time and, and recharge the batteries uh, listening to one like that. Awesome, Josh. Well, hey, appreciate you guys all giving a little bit of the professional and personal and the shameless plugs. I uh, appreciate that. So uh, for most of our audience, um, they may not be familiar with each of, of your guys' organizations. So maybe in like a quick 30 second elevator speech and we'll, we'll swing back the other way. We call it a snake style. Uh, we'll start with you, Josh. Uh, maybe 30, 60 seconds. LHC group, who are you guys? 
Yeah. So um, as, as you know, Gavin said at the intro, you know, we are um, a national organization. Uh, we operate in 37 states in the District of Columbia. Uh, I would say um, we really have grown our focus on all things in home health care. So from home health to, you know, personal care, home and community based services, palliative care, supportive care, all the way to end of life care and the hospice benefit. Uh, we do have some other service offerings um, that we can, you know, get into a little bit later uh, on this call. But uh, all in all, we really try to be a high value solution to, you know, the frail and elderly across the country and provide highest quality of care and service that we can. Awesome. Thanks, Josh. And one that stands out for me. So if anyone's here from uh, the Dallas area, uh, DFW Home Health is an example of how an LHC company, you may not even know it's part of the LHC group uh, because of their name. So we'll swing back around. Uh, let's go with you, Paul. Uh, maybe in a nutshell, Mission Healthcare. Yeah, so Mission is a uh, grassroots uh, home health and hospice organization. Uh, it was actually great seeing the LHC video. Um, I did not know the, the history of how that organization was founded. Uh, we're very similar, but yet a little different in the sense that we entered into a market space that was uh, highly competitive and had to differentiate ourselves in a variety of different ways. And we did that kind of through grit by going to areas that people wouldn't go to and uh, taking care of our employees is kind of our first mission. And uh, through that, uh, grew into what we are today, which is uh, 40 plus locations across the seven Western states, providing home health, hospice, and uh, palliative care services to about 5,000 patients each and every day. Awesome, Paul. And um, I'm not sure if you're going to touch on it later, but you've had some really rapid growth recently through acquisition. Are you able to touch on that really quickly over the last year or so? Yeah, so, you know, the story of Mission really has been that of growth from, from inception. We're only about a 12-year-old company uh, and, and really grew organically um, and just kind of into contiguous counties uh, for the first handful of years and didn't really acquire um, a whole lot. We did acquire uh, a small home health business at one point just to enter into a market uh, and really found the need to be able to have great density and really build the continuum out. Um, as you know, Southern California, um, you know, very populated, uh, not a whole lot of pine trees, more people than pine trees for sure. And those pine trees that we do have are, uh, are, are self-planted. They're not, they're not natural, uh, including the palm trees. And, uh, and we found that our ability to be able to provide care in that fashion, um, we were very successful. And by, by really having that success, we ultimately wanted to grow into Northern California and some of the neighboring states, which we felt shared a lot of the similarities that California shares uh, from a labor force perspective, from a payer perspective, and had the opportunity to do that through some, some pretty significant um, mergers and acquisitions over the last, uh, really over the last year, where we've uh, doubled in size over the last six months and uh, feel very fortunate to have the opportunity to you know, to bring those organizations into our platform and um, and call them a family of companies under the mission umbrella. Awesome. Thanks, Paul. And then, uh, Bob, over to you, maybe a quick elevator speech on uh, Home Healthcare News. Yeah, Home Healthcare News is the uh, largest B2B that's dedicated to covering the home health uh, and home care spaces, really everything under the sun when it comes to aging in place. Uh, HHCN is one of several verticals under the larger aging media network umbrella. Some of our sister sites are Skilled Nursing News, Senior Housing News, Behavioral Health Business, and uh, Hospice News. I actually just met Josh in person uh, for the first time a couple of weeks ago at Elevate, uh, a hospice news event. Uh, HHCN does a handful of in-person events per year. We also have the podcast, which we talked about, and uh, we recently rolled out our uh, more exclusive platform, HHCN Plus. We're doing video interview series on that as well, um, releasing quarterly reports. I'm sure I'm leaving out a couple of other things that we do, but uh, that's us in a nutshell. Yeah, and I've attended a few of your events, uh, Bob, and, and they are definitely first class. So folks, um, you know, whether you're home care, home health, hospice, acute care, if you interact or work with the post-acute world, Definitely highly encourage you guys to get connected with uh, Aging Media Network. Um, it's been a wealth of information for me, and it's really helped me on my day job um, in home care. So I uh, really appreciate that. I want to go back to Paul on the uh, growth of mission. So, uh, Paul, I remember uh, back in, I think, 20, I don't know, 2013, 2012, 2013, I went down to San Diego um, and uh, for work. 
And I've seen this company, Mission, and like you mentioned, the organic growth in the early days, and Mission was so strong in San Diego. I, and you guys did so much. It was very impressive because I hadn't heard of Mission at the time. You have a career uh, of strength where you've worked for large organizations and you've been a leader. So how did you end up first hearing about Mission and the opportunity? Yeah, it's a great story. You know, I spent uh, the first RF, part of please, the operator. I spoke. I uh, spent most of my career for the first, uh, call it, fifteen years with, uh, you know, with big national organizations like Accent Care, Vitas, uh, Gentiva, Kindred at Home, and uh, you know, a lot of transformational transactions in a lot of those businesses, and really learned just a ton about, um, you know, how to how to really operate in this space, and more importantly, how to take care of of people and our people being um, our employees. And as I had an opportunity uh, with a crossroads in my career, really wanted to find a place where I could land where um, we could really focus in on culture and the people. And uh, Mission was in my backyard. I've lived in San Diego and have basically been on the road for 20 years of my career. So selfishly, that was kind of a match made in heaven from uh, from the very beginning. Um, but what we found was that the um, the alignment of the original founders of the business who were really getting to a point to where they realized, uh, you know, the business had gotten too big for them to manage, that they had not had the exposure to really kind of scaling um, at the level they were at and the level we wanted to go through. And uh, it all came together really nicely. I think, uh, you know, we aligned very well on our, our core beliefs and our core values. Uh, um, as somebody's handing over a business that they've built for seven or eight years as a founder-led company, and, you know, Josh can speak to this, he's acquired a number of founder-led companies, um, you know, keeping that culture is really important and uh, making sure that the legacy continues is is really important. So we've stuck to that, you know, from, from inception when we only had a handful of employees and a handful of impatience, um, clear on up to what we do today with, uh, you know, roughly 1,800 um, caregivers out there in the field taking care of our patients and number of locations throughout a variety of different states. So um, we continue to, you know, want to have the desire to have great density in the states that we're in. So that will be really kind of the focus area. Um, you know, we don't want to be all things to all people. We just want to be really good to the people we have the opportunity to serve. And, um, you know, our philosophy may be a little bit different than some other organizations, but I think in your previous panelists, the ability to serve the communities that you serve, um, recognizing that they're each very, very different um, from the socioeconomic challenges that you're faced with to the diversity that you're faced with, the language barriers, uh, the payer mixes. If you don't really have a grasp on those things, um, trying to do what we do in the home health, hospice and palliative care arena is very challenging to, to meet the needs. So um, we like the idea of really staying true to who we are and really being committed to our, our growth philosophy, which we think ultimately equals to, you know, employees who are more engaged and ultimately patients who are getting better quality of care. Gavin, you're on mute. Man, it had to happen at least once. Jeez, <laughs> uh, uh, thank you for calling me out, Paul. Uh, well, nobody's I, FedEx, nobody's FedEx delivery has come yet, and the dogs have gone crazy. So that's that's <laughs> next up. So, so in the previous session, uh, there's definitely dogs. Uh, someone had to turn off their camera and audio to deal with something. <laughs> and uh, for those of us that were paying attention in this session, I think there was another thing as well. But uh, anyway, um, I wanted to mention for the the folks that have been. Uh, in the industry for a while may have heard of organizations like Silverado or uh, Healthy Living Network. So um, those are organizations that uh, that I know Paul, you and your team have partnered up with and uh, and really uh, leveraged to have that density that you're talking about. Uh, Bob, I'll get to you in a second, but I want to switch over to Josh really quickly um, on what's a little bit different, and that's LHC is known for its joint ventures. And so while there's been similarities with acquisitions, one thing you guys are really, really known for. Can you talk a little bit about that, Josh, and the, the JVs that you guys do at LHC Group? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And, I, you know, as Paul was just saying, they were talking, you know, I was playing it over in my head, you know, uh, founder based, founder, you know, driven organizations 
uh, that's also us. <laughs> so um, uh, here at LHC Group, not only have we acquired a lot of, you know, mission-minded founder-led organizations, but we're, we're founded as one and we still, you know, operate as one today. Uh, you know, we've got Keith and Ginger Myers. Keith's still our chairman and CEO and Ginger, uh, who is the first nurse and really the one that um, started LHC Group. Um, and, and the reason I, I start there, uh, Gavin, is... When, when you think about our hospital joint venture strategy, um, it really didn't start as a strategy. It has become one. Um, we're now the preferred joint venture partner for over 400 leading hospitals and health systems across the country. Uh, and I can get into a little bit more uh, of that here in just a moment. But when I think about you know, how that started and how we've had success with that, I go all the way back to the early days in 1998 Ginger, you know, had come out of the hospital setting. She had been a hospital nurse and was very comfortable and familiar operating as an extension of the hospital itself. So, you know, she went out and did her own home health thing in 1994. And by 1998, entered into our first ever hospital joint venture. Now, in the, call it the first decade of the JV strategy, the JV history of LHC Group, it was a lot of, you know, individual hospital, maybe a couple hospital systems in smaller markets. Um, and, and you had these hospitals, you know, CEO, CFO, CNOs that were, you know, looking for someone to come in that could help manage just the day to day operations of the home health. And it wasn't near the strategic focus. Uh, that it has become today. You mentioned, you know, Texas Health Resources in the DFW market earlier. You know, whether it's, you know, the likes of THR and Methodist and DFW, whether it's Geisinger up in the Northeast, Oshner here in our home state of Louisiana, the whole Christus system, um, LifePoint, uh, Baptist from Memphis down to Jackson, Mississippi. And I mean, I could go on and on. The, the volume of larger health system partnerships that we have you know, matured into over the last decade um, has really been hand in glove with the strategic value that those health systems are placing on the delivery of services in the home setting. They still want a partner like ourselves that can be the day-to-day -day operator and the one that manages the business that's outside the four walls of their hospital, but it is now very much a strategic forefront of where they're going with healthcare delivery in general whether it's reducing readmission rates, whether it's reducing, you know, ED bounce back visits. There's a lot of reasons why, you know, hospitals have been headed this direction. And then, Gavin, I would tell you, you know, uh, candidly, you know, we were moving in the direction of value-based care being much and much more on the forefront of healthcare delivery in our country um, and looking at different demonstration projects and ACO models. Uh, we do have an ACO management company. Uh, underneath LHC Group as well, not just on the home health hospice and um, personal care side, but we do have an ACO company as well. So you started seeing this evolution trending. And then with the global pandemic um, of COVID, that has really shined a light on the need to leverage high quality in-home health care providers, whether it's, you know, ourselves, mission or others, and whether you're partnering with the health system or not, the health systems are definitely looking to identify high quality providers in their market to decompress the pressure in their hospitals and alleviate and open up bed capacity for more highly acute patients. Um, I could go on and on about the JV strategy, Gavin, but um, I, I guess I should probably stop there. <laughs> That's good for now. I'll get back. We'll definitely get back to you, Josh, here in a little bit. Um, one thing to mention as well, uh, Josh is a, a legal expert, I believe, a lawyer by trade. Am I getting that right? Um, so uh, in the intros, I, I, I steered away from doing my typical spiel where I'm both an accountant and an attorney, because if I do that, everybody shuts off the podcast and moves on. Um, but yes, I do have both a legal background as well as an accounting background. Yeah, awesome. Um, and Bob, you're, you're up next here. I got a couple of questions for you. I remember our first meeting, Josh, I think you were the CFO at the time. And by the time your podcast in 2020 came out, you're actually president. Um, so very cool. And uh, for those of you that may have come in late, um, Paul, just a shout out to you for acknowledging the LHC video. Um, there's a really cool video about the background uh, that was played on our show today at about 10, 15 a.m. Pacific is when it was played. So folks, if you are interested in seeing that video, it just gives a little bit of a background, let us know. I know we also have one on mission as well, so we can uh, provide, uh, provide those videos for you, but uh, great videos to get a little bit of knowledge of uh, who these great organizations are. I don't know if, uh, I don't know, Bob, do you guys have a, a cool uh, uh, video at uh, Aging, Mu Aging Media Network or not yet? 
I'm, I'm sure we have something, uh, but I, uh, I, I try tend to focus on the news operations and all that other stuff is in a different part of the house, but I'm sure we have some, some sort of promotional video. Sounds good folks. If you're interested, uh, feel free to reach out to Bob. I know you're uh, active on LinkedIn there, Bob. So we're talking a lot about in-home care and, uh, you know, Bob used to write about technology in the past, which I think is more of a, you see in the general consumer news media, right? You see about technology, all, all the headlines. And one thing I, I, I always joke with my friends about is just the home care industry. When you're with, you know, folks maybe in their 20s, 30s, 40s, you know, when you talk about what's cool and hip in society, you know, home care in the general society, right? Isn't like, oh, exciting. I want to hear all about home care. So I, I want to ask you, Bob, you know, you've done a great job building your career. How do you, when you write about home care, is it tricky to make it exciting or what, what's been some keys for you to, to do that? Yeah. So I guess, first of all, I also had that attitude going into home health care news, right? Like I didn't take this job because I thought home health or home care was sexy uh, to write about. Um, it was just a really good job. I was covering startups and technology uh, on a freelance basis prior to this. And uh, if anybody has freelanced before, it, it just gets to be a grind. It's you're constantly working and there could be a lot of just instability with when you get it, when you get gigs, when you don't. Um, this really solid job came along and I was like, OK, home health, home care sounds a little bit interesting. But really quickly, you learn just how interesting and exciting home based care is. I mean, there's there's really no other market that has so many tailwinds. Um, and I came in to home health and home care right at this critical point where everybody's talking about shifting care into the home. You have these new payment models developing. Uh, so personally, it became exciting very quickly. Now, is it a challenge to make home health and home care exciting for our readers? Uh, absolutely not at all, because I think our readers are all operators themselves. They care about this stuff with a passion. If they're not operators, they might be vendors or technology companies working with the operators. And then we also just have, you know, analysts, uh, academic sources who follow the space very closely. So I'd, I'd say on a weekly basis, we might have a story on like ICD-10 coding or surveys. And I think to myself, man, this stuff is dense. And then we get 10 comments talking about how exciting that story was. <laughs> <laughs> now, Bob, if I thought people were going to shut down when I said I'm an attorney and an accountant, you just threw out ICD-10. Yeah. Yeah, man. <laughs> Josh, Josh probably got a little excited on the inside with that accounting background. <laughs> <laughs> He'll hit you up and ask for all those articles on ICD-10 codes. Um, okay, cool. That's a, that's a really good point, Bob. And, uh, you know, I threw this question out to you uh, as a challenge almost. You know, um, and I thought you answered it really well. And that it's a friendly reminder to the audience: home health care news isn't a uh, you know necessarily a consumer facing uh, you know publication, right? Or or media. It's really for businesses, and so that's a really good point, Bob. And it makes a lot of sense. And this is this is kind of relevant to this discussion point too. But I'd say two years ago, our audience they were more traditional home health providers, traditional home care agencies. But you could just see with the people who subscribe these days that uh, interest in home-based care is at an all-time high. A lot of VC folks are following us now. Um, a lot of more of like the mainstream media sources are following us now. I think everybody is trying to learn more about this space. Yeah, no, it, 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 it's a great point. And I think home healthcare news is, is the leading player in this space. The AG Media Network clearly is the leading space. Even at the conference in Chicago, uh, the future conference that I attended, um, one of, uh, you know, I've seen folks there that they're not, you know, home care people. They're like large, gigantic health system leaders, well-respected that serve dozens of millions of patients were there paying for admission to be at this conference. Uh, so kudos to you guys, Bob. It's great to see you grow in your career, as I mentioned uh, previously, and uh, kudos to the growth that you guys have had as an organization. So, Bob, let's stick with you. Let's try to make uh, Choose Home exciting since we're talking about it. Uh, excitement. So the Choose Home Act of 2021. I think this is for our audience. I really want to encourage you to hear what Bob has to say as he gives an overview of what is the Choose Home Act of 2021, uh, Bob. Yeah, and I'm sure Paul or Josh might have something to add as well. I know LHC Group in particular has been uh, a big supporter of the Choose Home legislation uh, and just that process of socializing it, uh, drumming up support in Congress. But uh, Choose Home, it was introduced in the Senate in July, introduced in the House in October. 
I think it has 30 or more uh, current co-sponsors roughly split between Republicans and Democrats. Uh, that's pretty hard to do these days. So I think this shows just how bipartisan it is that there is a ton of support for it. Um, generally speaking, what Choose Home seeks to do is create an add-on to the traditional home health benefit, specifically in regard to caring for a, um, a certain type of patient for 30 days following a hospital stay. Uh, the idea is to take somebody who maybe would have gone to a SNF and instead give them the choice to recover at home um, with traditional home health services, but maybe telehealth it if it would be helpful, with meals if it would be helpful, uh, personal care support if it would be helpful, uh, kind of like a tailored package to just keep that person where they probably want to recover. Um, what I'm hearing is there's a lot of excitement about Choose Home in Congress because it does two really important things. One, uh, it does shift care into the home, which is a health system-wide goal right now, but also uh, it is estimated to save a lot of money through averted sniff stays. I think an independent analysis actually found that uh, it would save about $247 million annually. Um, obviously, curbing uh, overall health care spend is really, really important. Um, and yeah, just as far as next steps, uh, home health advocates are... Uh, trying to gain support for Choose Home on Capitol Hill. Uh, eventually, it'll need to be scored by CBO and then uh, probably find its way into a, a larger legislative package at some point. Okay, great. And the CBO Congressional Budget Office, if mm -hmm. I have that right for our audience, uh, I know you guys are all gurus and experts in, in policy and, and home care, but I think a lot of our audience uh, may not be familiar with everything that's happening behind the scenes. So I appreciate you kind of laying that out for us. Um, Josh, uh, Bob mentioned that LHC has been big behind this push. Can you talk about that briefly? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, alluded to Keith, our chairman and CEO earlier, he's also uh, the chair of the Partnership for Quality Home Healthcare. Uh, so a lot of his time and effort is um, spent in D.C. with the partnership uh, driving initiatives such, such as Choose Home Care. And, and I would uh, tell you, Gavin and uh, Paul, Bob, you know, to all of our listeners, you know, I've been along Keith's side now, you know, for 15 years. Uh, he's been at this, you know, for 27 years. And uh, I think one of you said the words tailwinds. I think it might have been Bob. Um, from a public policy perspective and a support on Capitol Hill perspective in a very bipartisan way. <laughs> and as you alluded to, that's not the easiest thing to come by these days, but to have this much true bipartisan support uh, for an initiative um, is, is not only refreshing, it is extremely encouraging because uh, honestly, you know, choose home. Um, it, it, it is a natural, logical extension of moving more and more care to the home. Um, you know, if you can replace a lot of the lower acuity sniff stays with a little bit more robust at home care, then you're freeing up so much more capacity. You're able to overall kind of manage the capacity of our healthcare system in a different way while we face an aging population. And this aging population is going to need to be able to be cared for in the lowest cost setting, which has been proven to be the home and you've got all of whether it's referral sources now as well as you know the hospitals uh, being on board with this modality of delivering care and maybe even most importantly the consumer themselves the patients want to be cared for in their home everywhere you look at studies this is where it's pointing to so all in all you know extremely encouraged by the momentum we have um, the number of not only senators but you know house members that are you know jumping on board in support of this um, other industries uh, within healthcare that are coming out in support of this um, is is extremely encouraging for us to be a major part of the solution uh, to curbing the total cost of care in our company in our country's you know healthcare system. Awesome, Josh. And now, Paul, I'll give you a chance uh, to respond, and I have a follow uh, a separate question for you, Paul, in just a second. But I know a lot of the folks. Uh, that are either uh, watching live or listening or listening later, you might be in senior living or you might work in outpatient settings. And this makes perfect sense for your residents or your population that you serve. Um, so I encourage you, if you're not already aware or following the Choose Home Act of 2021, to check it out. Uh, follow Aging Media or Home Healthcare News, and they give updates regularly. Bob's, uh, or, you know, his group, his team is, is constantly reporting on this. 
So Paul, um, I had a, a different route I wanted to go with you, but I wanted to give you the opportunity. Anything you wanted to add on Choose Home Act besides no, we talk I, before we talk I, about it? Oh, go ahead. Nothing to add from what Josh had said. Honestly, I'd give him my time uh, to talk about this. Uh, LHC has done yeoman's work, um, you know, from top to bottom around this, and um, you know, from from lobbying in in, in Congress to um, to really setting up their model to be prepared for caring for patients in in this type of setting. So, um, Josh, congratulations to to what LHC and you all have done. It's it's going to pave the way for the industry for sure. Yeah, well, thanks for that, Paul. And it really is an industry effort here. Um, you know, we uh, enjoy being a part of it, but this is good for first and foremost, the patients, as, as you and I share that common uh, theme throughout. This is in the best interest of healthcare and the patients, and our industry will all benefit from it. Yeah, great point. Um, okay, so Paul, over to you. Earlier this summer, I had the chance to get to know one of your colleagues. We brought him up earlier, uh, Damien. Uh, who has the boat. Um, and he was sharing with me some pretty cool things that you guys are doing at Mission with certain patient populations that historically, you know, with tradition, traditional payment models, things like that, most post-acute home health deliverable organizations would run away from. Are you able to touch on some of the, the new things you guys are doing with certain populations that historically people were a little bit scared to help? Yeah, I, I'd love to spend some time on this. And, you know, I, I, I I refocus our team all the time because there's a lot of really interesting things that are out there that you could really spend an inordinate amount of time um, focusing in on and trying to build out. Um, as, as we've seen, you know, there's been a lot of ideas, but what, what ultimately sticks is extremely important and not losing sight of, you know, today, what's the most important thing, which is we have number of, you know, we have probably unmet need today from the patient population that is coming into the home and, and ensuring that we can care for them properly, you know, has to be at the forefront of every one of our thoughts. And, um, but at the same time, you know, making sure that we're a part of the, the transformational components of what is going to happen specifically within home health and hospice, I think is extremely critical. And, you know, through a number of different partnerships that we've had, and, and, and Josh can probably attest to this, when, when you're partnering with hospital systems, teaching universities, um, you really get a seat at a table that is a very different conversation. It's not a transactional conversation. It's more about trying to find solutions. And I think much like um, the CEO of SCAN had mentioned, is there are folks today that are out there that currently don't have access to care. How do, how do we care for them? Um, so we're doing some work around some indigent patient population management, which in Southern California is a big issue. Obviously, a, a border state with uh, with Mexico and us having such a large presence in Southern California. Um, we've got a number of folks who have needs, healthcare needs, who are currently accessing the hospitals for all in every ounce of care that they currently receive and how can home health play a role in that and creating different types of programs with health systems to where we can ultimately play a solution and that is something that we're really excited about we think it really can make a difference um, and ultimately those are some of the patients that have the least amount of resources the least amount of support and their socioeconomic scenarios are relatively dire so um, you know, we see that as being an area that we want to be able to support in the communities that we're in and finding ways to, you know, do it successfully. And I think something that was said earlier on was something that's sustainable. Um, and and that's, that's equally as important here that, you know, in the shortage of, of nursing um, that is out there across the country, um, you know, where you put your nurses and making sure that, you know, your your charity care is, you know, managed effectively. Um, you have to really think about that as, as a home health and hospice operator, whether you're a for-profit or not-for-profit, somewhere in between. Um, the old adage of, you know, no margin, no mission is, is very true. And we feel like with some of the density we have, especially in some of our underserved communities, we can really make a difference there. I think the other piece that I'll, I'll just share with is, you know, we're, we're really entering into a lot of shared risk agreements and, and have a number of them really in our, our pipeline as we speak today, um, believing that we can help manage some of the risk. Um, in the past, home health and hospice was so far downstream that a lot of payers couldn't quite understand how to incentivize a home health or a hospice provider to participate. 
you know, they, they kind of looked at it as, you know, uh, a much higher level kind of issue that they could try to manage themselves. Now they're starting to see that the post-acute care providers, specifically home health, can be a real solution um, to some of the challenges that they've had. And, and when you look at the spend, um, it's all about high-risk patients who ultimately end up back in the hospital and almost anticipated. Um, so, so we see that as something that we're not only involved in today, but that will evolve over the course of time and in markets where we have good density, where we have quick response times, uh, where we've got a, a, a litany of um, caregiver options, uh, we think that we can really provide some some solutions in some of those markets. Well, uh, can I ask a, a clarifying yeah. question? Sorry to cut you off. Um, I think most of our audience is probably familiar with the term risk. I do know I have a few of my colleagues um, that are joining who might be new to home care. Um, and might be in roles where they're not doing an analysis or insurance or, or sales. Could you maybe in layman's terms, explain what taking on risk means for a home health entity? Sure. So traditionally how home health and hospice have been paid on the hospice side, really a, a per diem rate on the home health side, you know, really a fee for service or an episodic payment. Um, and, and taking on risk is really basing your outcomes on that patient. Um, to the reimbursement that you receive. And, and that can be structured in a variety of different ways. Um, but what it ultimately does is it really requires the provider to have great confidence in the care and more importantly, to the response to the needs of their patients quite differently than in the past um, because they ultimately didn't have any type of liability, so to speak, as a home health or hospice provider when a patient went back to the hospital or readmitted or accessed a lot of different healthcare services that could have been potentially avoided. Now we're basically saying we want to participate in that and we're willing to put the payment that home health would receive or that hospice would receive on the line for the quality outcomes that we can drive and ultimately keeping patients at home with the care that they need versus in the institutional setting where we all understand it's quite expensive, especially on that readmission type of patient who has some type of acute exacerbation. So that's really what, what that is. And, I, and, I'll, and I'll share, and I know that um, Josh at LHC and, and many others um, who have a little bit more forward thinking in the industry um, are really using technology um, to be able to manage that very differently today than how we have in, in the past five to 10 years historically. Um, I think I would tell you that I used to always be concerned about negotiating with insurance companies because I knew that they had better data than I could ever imagine that I had. They actually knew my outcomes better than I knew my outcomes, if that makes any sense. Uh, now we actually have technology that allows us the opportunity to really understand our patient mix at the bedside and, and who the high-risk patients are, whether, you know, we use quite a bit of machine learning. Uh, we're util utilizing a lot of predictive modeling um, in our care models, and then even some of the wearables that we're using in some pilots today to be able to help us be able to better manage patients, uh, making the investment on the front end, and ultimately giving our clinicians the tools and the resources that they need. But I'll add one more caveat to that because I think there's, there's something that was mentioned earlier on and it's across the industry. And that is, you know, there is a healthcare shortage um, specifically around clinicians that all of us are being faced with. And to all the things that was mentioned um, on the previous panel, um, that impacts everybody, not just at the acute care setting, but it ultimately flows all the way down to post-acute care providers. So I think, you know, the way that we think about taking care of patients, technology is going to be really important, making sure that every visit that is needed is provided on the right patient and that we understand why. Um, and I think that's where the technology evolution into home health and into hospice is going to kind of evolve the way that we currently provide care than what has historically been provided. And it will ultimately help address a couple of different pieces, not just some of the reimbursement models that may, may be to come, but more importantly, the things that we're faced with today, which is there's not enough clinicians to currently support the need that we have today let alone the movement of moving more patients into the home from other settings. So yeah. how do providers ultimately adjust and adapt accordingly, I think is, uh, is something that folks have to really give some thought to. Definitely, Paul. And that's a good uh, transition point for us as we uh, wrap up uh, with the last few minutes here. I want to go back to Bob as kind of our national guru. 
um, as not just a reporter, which I said in my introduction, but you're actually the editor, right? So you are actually leading a team of reporters now as well. So what are you seeing, Bob, as tangible solutions uh, with the caregiver workforce, whether it's clinicians, aides? Um, and for, let, let me just clarify, a lot of the talk is like, oh, strategy, kind of high level, but are you, are you seeing any real solutions here, if you mind me asking? So I think the short answer is there is no magic bullet, right? Like there's no yeah. single solution. If I did have a single solution, I think I could get Mission 24-Hour Home Care or LHC Group to, to pay me a pretty pet penny. <laughs> uh, yeah. You would, you would. <laughs> but I think, you know, we've, we've heard and we've reported that it's a combination of things like, yes, increasing compensation and bonuses is important, but it can't just be that. Uh, it's also about reducing paperwork and some of those documentation bur uh, burdens, especially on the uh, uh, skilled side when applicable. Um, it's investing in training programs and creating a career ladder. Somebody wants to know that they have a runway to really take off uh, in front of them, that they're not going to be stuck in the same position for a decade. Um, my personal view is that workforce shortages across healthcare are going to persist until we as a country figure out a way to actually increase the pipeline of clinicians, of caregivers, other uh, professionals, whether it's in the home or another setting. Um, and I don't know ultimately what that's gonna mean. I mean, does it, does it mean going to people in college earlier? Does it mean doing a better job recruiting like out of high school and letting people know that the home is a place where you could uh, do really, really good work uh, in the future? Um, a couple of years ago, there was this idea of like a government sponsored Peace Corps for uh, senior care. Uh, I don't know what ultimately happened to that, but I feel like those types of programs could be a solution as well. Really incentivize, incentivize younger people to like they would join the Peace Corps or join, you know, the senior care corps to help take care of folks. Yeah, I think vocational schools, um, are, I've been talking to my wife about this. Um, you know, we come from, we're both college folks, we went to college. And I think, um, I, hopefully she never hears this or watches this, but I think my son might be a great person. He's so good with his hands and, you know, maybe traditional college isn't it, but he can, you know, go to a vocational school and do something with his hands. And so what you're onto makes a lot of sense, Bob. Guys, um, we really are running short on time. So I, if I can ask a favor, I wanna give Paul and Josh both an opportunity if you guys wanna address this question, I'll start with you, Paul. But if you can try to keep it 30, 60 seconds on how you're addressing the workforce. Starting with you, Paul. Yeah, I, I think I, I just made a, a few comments about it before. You know, like Bob said, there's there's no magic formula here. I think you have to do a lot of things um, in hopes to mitigate any of the the headwinds that we're all going to be faced with. And um, I, I would tell you the one thing that I think is the most important is you know making sure that you drive a culture with the employees that you currently have uh, to retain them and. Uh, you know, these folks are the ones who have gotten us through the pandemic and the ones who have given effortless, effortlessly and have, you know, put their families aside at times, have gone into homes where they were concerned, you know, unvaccinated before the vaccine was available, um, have really, you know, lived their mission through their work. Uh, I think that's, that's an area that can't be lost. You know, we can look at recruiting tactics and enhancing recruitment teams and you know, sign on bonuses and, and pay and all of those things that everyone is really doing. Um, but what ultimately differentiates you without having just a larger pool of, of nurses to be able to pull from. Uh, I think there is one other piece here that, you know, in the past, and Josh can probably speak to this, you know, a lot of us used to be able to pull in travelers from abroad. Um, and that's been a lot more challenging <clears throat> um, in today's environment. Uh, we would be able to get therapists and nurses from uh, from other countries. Um, I think, you know, some of the things that the country has gone through, you know, kind of halted or slowed that process down. But I do think that there's some solutions that are out there that could really help the entire healthcare ecosystem. Um, because I would say that it, it is relatively a crisis when you hear about the National Guard being sent into hospitals. That, that to me is blinking red lights that there's a significant challenge around staffing. And, and if hospitals are having that challenge with some of the things that they're offering, um, you know, they're basically going into the coffers to, to try to find staff all across the country to come and work for them. 
uh, much different than a post care a post acute care provider can can do. Um, I think yeah, Paul, keep this continue. Thanks, Paul. I apologize for interrupting. I just want to make sure we get to Josh before uh, having to yeah. having to wrap up here. So great ideas, and then Josh. Uh, sure. So I would, uh, when I always start this answer, I, I want to bring it down and say all healthcare is local. <laughs> so, you know, we think about a national nursing shortage and a national staffing issue, but I mean, in so many ways, it's really market by market. And, and you know, so you got to make sure you're competitive and pay competitive and benefits, all the things that both Bob and Paul have said. Um, I couldn't agree more with what Paul said about um, the retention and the importance of retention. Um, in addition to recruiting new staff, and that really does tie to culture. Um, but uh, uh, one of the things that we're doing here at LHC Group that's a little bit more long-term forward thinking, um, and you know, Bob alluded to it, which is the pipeline. Uh, we have recently made a pretty big investment and we're partnering with University of Louisiana Nursing School uh, to not only work directly on the pipeline, but to go together and seek some grants and do some initiatives around nursing in the home um, and, and really expanding that pipeline of workforce as well. Because at the end of the day, uh, whether it's the documentation efficiencies that Bob referred to, whether it's even travel efficiencies, and making sure how you organize your scheduling. Um, uh, I believe, and, and I think Paul, you know, I, I think you might even agree with this, in an environment where you have a shortage, we have an offering that is a lot more flexible to the workforce. So if we can harness those attributes and those, you know, flexibilities, if you will, I think it will allow for more workforce to come into the home at the same time that more demand is coming into the home. Because historically, I think home health was also a little bit of an afterthought on the workforce until later on in their healthcare profession. Yeah, great, great points. And that's really cool about the partnership that you're having there with the university, Josh. And it's, uh, it's investments that I think companies with your size, you know, um, I forget what what such and Jane said, but it's like almost like it's your not an obligation, but like your duty to to lead the way, be the trailblazer. I know Paul, you gave kudos uh, to Josh earlier that we touched on. Um, being a trailblazer is not easy, and some people shy away from it, and the rest of us, you know, get to go on the ragtails and seek and reap the rewards of your hard work. But um, yeah, it's really neat to see, and uh, you all bring up some really good points as we wrap up today, folks. Um, we are going to have a uh, we have about a thousand dollars worth of prizes. I'm going to name some of the winners here in just a moment, but I want to give. I know we're over a minute, so maybe Bob, Josh, Paul. I'm going to just assume you guys are active on LinkedIn and you provide updates. Actually, Josh, I don't think you're on LinkedIn. How can folks? Is it LHC Group that they can follow, Josh? Yep. Okay. Right. So LHC Group on LinkedIn. Uh, Bob, you're pretty active on LinkedIn. Paul, I believe you're pretty active on LinkedIn. So uh, folks, feel free to follow these guys. And again, sorry for uh, wrapping up quickly here, but um, uh, Bob, Josh, Paul, you guys have been great. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Gavin. Thanks, Thanks Gavin. Gavin. Thanks, Paul. Abs Thanks, Bob. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. Thanks everyone for tuning in to another episode of Pop Health Podcast. We hope you've enjoyed today's episode. And if you have and want to check out other episodes, visit us at pophealthpodcast.com, iTunes or Apple Music, Spotify, Stitcher, and now YouTube as well. Take care.